All right, so this video is going to run along, and uh, it's about economics. So if either part of that last sentence scares you, I'd suggest hitting the back button right now. Um, I want to talk about uh, business cycles, and um, or as they're as they're known uh, back in the old days, the boom and bust cycle. Um, I'm going to go through some of the main theories out there uh, to, that try to explain the business cycle and then um, end with what I think is the best explanation of them, which will in some ways synthesize some of the others. Um, the one I want to start with is um, one that's all too widely believed and I don't understand why it's so popular. It's called uh, Real Business Cycle Theory or RBC Theory. Uh, this is mainly associated with um, what what are called freshwater economics, sort of the the Chicago School neoclassical free market types. Um, basically, what what this theory does is it sees the uh, boom and bust as responses to shocks in the market, such as technological innovation or you know oil prices or new regu government regulations or you know any sort of exogenous shock, any, anything that's not, it, it's not uh, built into the market itself. Um, and the idea is that markets react efficiently and optimally to, uh, to these shocks. Because the, the, the market is basically treated as rational. And so because the market, because the market in this theory uh, always reacts in an optimal manner, uh, the RBC theorists uh, basically oppose any sort of government intervention to try and correct uh, the market's uh, reaction. Um, it basically treats uh, unemployment as voluntary. It, the idea being that uh, when there is a, a, um, a fall in production, you know, a negative shock, that um, basically in order to have full employment, uh, wages would have to fall to a certain level, uh, but workers aren't willing to accept those wages, and so rather than take a job at the um, at the level that would uh, allow for full employment, they instead choose to be unemployed, uh, and, um, and you know wait for wages to we'll wait for employment to rise again before you know ra rather than than take a, a lower wage. Um, so I, uh, although I've I've heard that there's you know more subtlety to it than what I just described, it still strikes me as a pretty awful theory. Um, for one thing, you know, it's, it's a, it basically treats the boom and the bust as a surprise, um, uh, because partly because it sort of denies the existence of bubbles. For the, for this theory, prices are always rational. There you know there is no there's no such thing as you know any asset being overpriced. It's always just whatever the market price is, that's the right price. And the market's always the market's always right in setting the price, um, because and so because of this, uh, it has basically zero predictive ability. You can't use it to predict any sort of recession, which is why no RPC theorists did predict this current recession. Um, and that, in turn, is why uh, you heard so many economists in this crisis say, "We, you know, nobody saw it coming." Well, you guys didn't because your model doesn't allow you to see it coming. It it does. It's unfalsifiable and no, has no predictive value. Um, there is another free market theory that does have some uh, predictive value, uh, and. Uh, would, and it's probably more popular here on YouTube than in uh, much much of the, uh, the than among most people you meet or m most economists, and it's called the Austrian business cycle theory. Now this is associated with the Austrian school, people like uh, Hayek and von Mises, um, and you know followed today by like Ron Paul and Peter Schiff, people like that, um, sort of the sort of hyper libertarian group. Um, but anyway, so the Austrian theory sees the central bank as basically the culprit in uh, in business cycles. The idea is that they create artificially low interest rates, which create which create an expansion of credit, 
uh, and the credit the credit expansion creates the the artificial appearance of greater savings than than the real savings that are in the economy. And um, there is a malinvestment in capital goods, and this is what really distinguishes the Austrian schools is they believe in the uh, heterogeneity of capital. Not all capital is created equal, and uh, you'll have different rates of return, and um, the uh, manipulation of interest rates will distort that uh, rate of return, and so people will you know, take take on loans on the assumption that that the rate of return will last. Uh, and then uh, when banks become overextended, they yeah you know, they can't keep lending at the prevailing interest rates, and so uh, they have to they have to raise interest rates, and uh, then then there's a then people can't pay off their loans, and there's a credit crunch, and a recession, and um, the Austrians and is essentially I mean as far as they, they kind of, in some ways they agree with the RBC theorists about what to do uh, because you know they think that the recession is actually kind of good for the economy that that the um, you know the recession is how the, the is how the economy can learn but at the same time they also uh, believe that for the long term what uh, the economy needs is you know they, they, they advocate abolishing central banks you know like Ron Paul's uh, movement to end the Fed, yeah, and they uh, also advocate generally either um, free banking or um, or a gold standard. A lot of them both because they think that the free market will voluntarily choose a gold standard. But, um, but yeah, in any case, that uh, so for them the sort of cent central banks are are the, are the problem. Uh, because of the um, distortion caused by by manipulating interest rates, um, so the next theory is is Keynesian theory, and in, in a lot of economics debates still here, it's you're sort of the Keynesians versus the Austrians that um, which would lead you to think they're polar opposites, but in fact uh, the two theories are closer than you might, uh, than it originally appears. I mean, Keynes was in fact influenced in large part by the Austrian school, uh, even though you know they they came up with radically different views on how to react to the um, uh, to the business cycle. Um, so what's central to Keynes is the idea of uncertainty, uh, and, he, and he contrasts this with um, risk, because risk is something that can be calculated. By a lottery ticket, that's a risk. You, you can calculate exactly what your odds are of winning the lottery, um, and uh, adjust accordingly. With uncertainty, there's nothing to calculate. You can't calculate uncertainty, and that's what a lot of um, people who call themselves Keynesians since then have forgotten. They they try to turn uncertainty into risk, and you just, you can't do that. So for, for Keynes, um, the idea is that um, firms make long-term fixed investments based on long-term expectations. And they get those expectations based on what the, the current trend is, because that's how you react to uncertainty, is you go with whatever whatever things are like whatever things are like now. Um, and for him, unlike in um, Classical, uh, classical economics. He believes that there was a disequilibrium. Um, there's a disequilibrium between uh, spending and interest rates. Um, that uh, you know when, uh, and, and so as, as a result, you know spending uh, falls ahead of uh, the of of of, of interest, or spending doesn't. Um, doesn't react the same at the same rate as interest rates, and so um, this leads to often in, in cases where, where interest rates change, an excess of savings, um, meaning that people spend less of their money. So there is insufficient demand to meet the uh, fixed the fixed capital uh, that the firms invest in, which leads to an accumulation of inventories. So they have excess inventories and. Uh, 
you know, they can't sell. So uh, they cut back production, which leads to unemployment. And with less employment, there's a greater uh, uh, propensity to save, or another way of putting it is, le is there's less demand. Because uh, A, you know, unemployed people aren't, aren't earning an income, therefore aren't able to spend. Um, and people who are employed you know, get scared by that and that might be next, and so they cut back their consumption as well. Um, and so, you know, rather than uh, reaching a steady equilibrium between uh, spending and interest rates, it, this uh, they spiral out of control, and uh, you know, until it reaches equilibrium in a recession. And so, you know, Kane, what Keynes advocated was that uh, in the in the case of this savings glut where nobody's spending. Uh, the government should step in as spender of last resort by spending on infrastructure projects, uh, you know, hiring government workers, um, putting money in people's pockets, which they then uh, which then stimulates demand. So they so they buy the goods that firms uh, produce, which then allows firms to plan for uh, for expanding their production. And hiring more workers and gets the economy going again. Um, and uh, you know, a lot of people only know this part of, of Keynesian economics. Don't take into account the other part, which is that when times are good during the boom, government is supposed to uh, run a surplus by uh, increasing taxes, cutting spending, and um, raising interest rates. And and, and and that way, you sort of Soften the or or, or you, you sort of dampen down the boom, and um, and and there and also have a surplus from which to spend when there's a slump again. So uh, anyway, in the '60s there was a guy named Hyman Minsky who's uh, th this is where we can talk about post-Keynesian economics. Um, Minsky was sort of a disciple of Keynes, but he also kind of in, uh, integrated with some of the Austrian schools as well. Um, you may remember my last video I talked about the endogenous theory of money, um, which basically says that you know rather than uh, rather than loans being supply driven, uh, that in fact um, the amount of money and lending is determined by the the demand for money in the market, uh, and, and that um, and that loans create their own deposits. So, uh, so Minsky believed in the he followed the endogenous theory of money and it was central to his financial instability hypothesis. Um, and what he found was that you know after after a crash when the economy was first starting to recover, uh, banks would lend conservatively. And uh, then uh, those those loans would come back good, you know that uh, they uh, they had a they had very few defaults on, on those loans, and so they said, well, okay, well um, things seem to be improving. We'll come, we can go ahead and lower interest rates, and then um, uh, and then take on riskier loans, and so uh, as. So as, as loans keep getting paid back, then optimism grows and loans get riskier, and um, and so people take on more debt, uh, you know, and and uh, you know, there's more speculation, and uh, so as as the as demand increases, interest rates start to go up, and people keep refinancing debt at higher interest rates, and you get you know, the sort of Ponzi finance stuff, like the whole derivatives mess. Um, and but then eventually people get so over leveraged with debt, uh, they start selling off good assets to finance their debt. Um, and then you know as the general optimism turns to pessimism, more and more firms do this. Uh, you know, afraid of, of the, you know, uh, you know, afraid of um, defaulting on their debts, and so they keep selling off more and more assets until there's no one to buy assets because everyone's trying to sell. 
uh, which leads to uh, what's called a Minsky moment. And that's the, the turning point when the whole system comes crashing down. Uh, this, this is what happened with uh, the current recession. Uh, it was precipitated by a Minsky moment when uh, assets could not be sold off. Uh, and, and so there was a you know, vast crash in, in asset prices and um, a bunch of deleveraging of debt. Um, and so Minsky, you know, much like Keynes, he, he was a big government guy. He believed the government should be able to, um, you know, uh, you, he emphasized the role of the central bank as lender of last resort, even though, even though he doesn't necessarily believe that uh, the central bank has much influence on interest rates and, and stuff like that. Um, and uh, you know, he advocate, advocated you know, tight regulation of the financial sector you know, in, in order to prevent the sort of Ponzi finance that becomes part of it. And then, of course, counter cyclical policy like Keynes. Um, so, anyway, um, those are some major theories that are out there today. Uh, for those of you who have been following my channel for a while, you may know that I'm somewhat a disciple of Henry George, a 19th century economist who emphasized the role of land in an economy and uh, advocated land value taxation. He had his own theory uh, about booms and busts, which I'll only go over briefly. Um, he basically, it was that land speculation drove the price of land uh, until eventually, you know, you get too high for uh, workers to work on it, and uh, you know, then unemployment followed. Um, whereas that that basically is based entirely around land, and doesn't take account of capital or money. Which, if you notice, the other theories I talked about. Almost all of them are centered around money, finance, and, and capital. Um, so you know the George's thing talks about the real economy, and um, the rest. The you know, others, other other than RBC theory, talk about the finan uh, the financial sector. So um, there was an economist named uh, Mason Gaffney at A. George's who kind of combined uh, some of these the sort of Georgia's emphasis on the real economy with um, with, with his other theories. It is sometimes called a, an Austrian Georgia synthesis, although you know, for me, I, I kind of you know, implement some of these other schools of thought as well. Um, so this this theory accepts the Austrian distinction about, you know, about capital, that not all capital is created equal. Specifically, there's short-term capital and long-term capital or high turnover capital versus low turnover capital. Um, so short-term capital, capital that um, has a quick turnaround period, a quick maturity rate, each time it sort of matures and turns around, um, it, you reapply labor to it. So it's, so it's labor intensive. Long-term capital, uh, like real estate, tends to be um, less labor intensive. You have a one-time application of labor and then it just uh, and, and it sits there and, and um, long-term capital tends, tends to be financed during um, low interest rates, but the but the thing is that uh, that even though it's even though it's financed by low interest rates, it, uh, interest actually ends up eating up more of the cost because it's. Uh, because that is a longer maturity rate, and so each year you're basically paying interest on it without applying new la uh, new labor to it. So interest takes up more of the cost than than labor. Um, and so one thing about long term capital is, uh, you know, it tend part of the uh, the sort of source of funds for that, the source of wealth to finance the long term capital is rising land values. Yeah, that's sort of the base of the economy. When it comes to land, labor, and capital, land is the foundation, the base from which all uh, all the rest is financed. Yeah, I mean, there's there's mortgage financing, but there's also uh, you know people putting up their land as collateral. It it becomes the basis on which you you count it as current income for for the sake of uh, of financing. Um, 
and so uh, and so during a boom, you know, there's lots of investment in long-term capital, and uh, you know the uh, yeah, um, employment is kept up by you know, continual investment in that long-term capital, uh, you, even though that even though there's a long turnover rate for it, as long as as long as you keep building more and more of it, then you can still invest. Um, then you can still keep employment up, but uh, you know at a certain point it gets overextended because uh, you know there's not enough. Uh, because it, it has such a long mat maturity rate, and you know, it's not turning over quickly enough, so then you get this sort of uh, savings glut, similar to what Keynes talked about, you know, with the accumulation of inventories, the the um, excess of a capital over the demand for it, um, which you know, as Keynes talked about, was brings about a decrease in production, and you know, like. Um, uh, there's also you know, the buildup of debt to finance the stuff, which uh, you know leads leads to the um, you know what we're talking about the Minsky moment that there's uh, you know eventually they, they can't uh, finance you know they can't finance the new debt so they have to sell off start selling off assets and decreasing production and so then there's that spiraling out of control uh, debt deflation. And so, and and here's and here's the thing that then, um, in, in response to this, if if you know there's any sort of sense of Keynesianism left in there, the government will then um, create, will then uh, try to stimulate the economy with inf with long-term infrastructure spending, which then reinflates the bubble because again it's long-term spending, and is you know trying to. Yeah, and and doesn't have a quick turn, turnover rate. So in the short term, it does increase employment, and because um, the economy moving again, but it get, but it gets it moving again back into the glut of long of mal of malinvestment in the long term capital. Um, now, no, that's not that's not such a problem if, uh, like like Keynes advocated during the, you know during the height of the boom, you sort of dampen expectations by um, uh, by cutting spending and raising interest rates and all that because uh, then the high interest rates you know the high high higher expense it makes um, capital more expensive which then leads to more uh, short-term capital investments so it doesn't really reduce the money supply as is often supposed but it does lead to more short-term capital spending so that, and that's why during the Keynesian era, from the post-war period until the early '70s, uh, there was relative stability in the economy. But um, for but under this model, of course, the the long-term solution is taxed land values. Of course, so if you have a high tax on on the value of land, you know, not only do you prevent speculation in land values and on the capital. Uh, the the other kinds of speculation that are built upon the rising land values, but you also uh, fix the the malinvestment of capital so that capital gets invested in more short term capital that has a quick turn turnover and the high turnover rate helps ensure full employment. Uh, you know, and it and you don't need this counter cyclical policy because it's uh, it, it it ensures continuous. Full employment and uh, dampens any sort of uh, specu uh, speculative boom. So that is how, uh, as Mason Gavin said, to thaw credit now and forever. So, uh, hope that makes sense. Uh, hope I didn't put you to sleep. Um, have a good day and peace.